start the last session of our MPC launch. We will now have our last debate on another topical issue, which is to know what will be or what can be the, way, the response to recurrent refugee crisis in EU's neighborhood. Yesterday, Philippe Farg observed that there has been a decrease in the number of asylum seekers and refugees worldwide, while the number of international displaced persons uh, was still growing. If we uh, look specifically at the EU, we observe that there has been a decrease in the number of asylum seekers uh, sin, um, since 2002 and a, a very sharp decrease in this uh, uh, very year 2002. And it was the time when the EU had managed, had started to manage to uh, obtain the contribution of uh, third countries to border control and migrant, uh, migration management at its external border, uh, like Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, which help contain migrants uh, on their territory, on their side, and including potential asylum seekers. Last year, during the Libyan crisis, we saw that EU member states' response to uh, this need for protection uh, was to strengthen the Mediterranean border to prevent people from arriving to European territory and to um, propose a help from distance through funding, technical assistance, so that to develop the protection capacity in uh, its neighborhood. So uh, the main question is to know if in the future uh, EU's response to a refugee crisis in its neighborhood will be um, to go on helping from distance uh, to develop outsourcing the protection of refugees and to process asylum application on third countries' territories in reception centers, uh, like uh, it has been a EU project for the last 10 years. And to discuss this very sensitive issue, we have the honor to receive two high-profile specialists and stakeholders in migration and refugee issues. Uh, first, uh, we will start with Peter Schatz, uh, who has had a long and successful career at IOM, where he has been working for more than 20 years, I think. Uh, is currently director of the regional office of IOM for the Mediterranean and chief of mission in Italy. Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry, if, if I made some uh, mistakes in the information. Uh, is responsible for providing policy advice on migration and he represents the IOM in Italy. No. <laughs> 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 so I think you will start with correcting your, your biography. Ah, so I thought, I'll, I'll so I thought it was in a previous life yeah. and that you had chance. <laughs> And in addition to be uh, to have this high position at IOM, Peter Schatzer uh, is also uh, uh, has also an, ac an academic activity uh, very intense. He's a lecturer at uh, uh, the University of Bergamo. He's a lecturer on migration management and development, and he is the author of numerous articles on migration and development and related topics. And we also uh, have the pleasure to uh, receive Jeff Crisp, uh, who is both also a practitioner and a thinker about refugee and migration issue. He is the head, currently head of the Evaluation and Policy Analysis Unit at UNHCR. He has first-hand experience in humanitarian program and UN operation all over the world. And he is the co-director co of a major program on poverty 
poverty, migration and asylum established by the UN University's World Institute for Development Economics Research. And he has also widely published on migration, refugee and humanitarian issues. And he serves on the advisory boards of numerous journals specializing, specializing on international migration. So uh, it's now your turn. Uh, we'll start with uh, Peter Schatze uh, for this very topical and oh. sensitive debate. Thank you very much. In fact, you were, well, you would have been right uh, with my description of my job about two or two and a half years ago because I spent seven years in Rome as director for the Mediterranean, one of the most exciting times of my professional life, uh, in part because it was the time when we opened the office in Lampedusa, the office in Libya, the office in uh, Tunisia, uh, started to work with Morocco, uh, and with the uh, Karim project also. In fact, we had some uh, fascinating cooperation with Philippe and his team uh, that I still remember fondly. Unfortunately, then about three years ago, I became the victim of forced migration. I was uh, asked to go back to Geneva, to the headquarters of IOM, and I'm now the chief of staff there, but uh, only for a few more months, and then I'll retire and become a senior advisor to the director general for some more time. But. Uh, my years uh, in the Mediterranean area, because I started with IOM in 1986, also as chief of mission in Italy for four years, uh, has given me a lot of insights into this area, and some of them I'll try to convey in uh, this uh, rather personal presentation uh, that will look at uh, some of the crisis areas around the Mediterranean that somehow influence the flows that we then see in the papers in, uh, on TV screens and so on. Um, some basic issues on uh, migration. I think uh, we always have to underline that all migrants enjoy basic human rights. I put there in principle because sometimes they are not observed, but there is enough international uh, human rights legislation, national legislation around that should ensure that all migrants enjoy these rights. Unfortunately, it's not always uh, enacted. Another one, practically each country is affected today by migration in many ways. Uh, the majority of the migrants of the 214 million international migrants and the 740 internal migrants uh, uh, does not require assistance, they don't require uh, intervention, unlike refugees. And this is also one of the reasons why, uh, why an organization like mine does not have a mandate given by the international community that's expressed through a convention. Uh, but what we notice and where we try to become more active also as IOM is uh, increasing anti-migrant sentiment, anti-migrant rhetoric, uh, a focus on control, a focus on security. And this is why it is so important uh, that the work of the new center here will try to create the basic knowledge, the facts that the policy makers need in order to counter some of these uh, assertions. In IOM we are also uh, convinced that uh, migration is inevitable. Uh, it's not something even if the rhetoric goes against it, you can do much. And there are these eight Ds uh, that uh, we have come up with, uh, and uh, I guess uh, You'll probably get access to the slides later, so I don't go into each one of them. But uh, the mix of those makes people move. Uh, coming back to our region, and unfortunately the colleague from ICMPD is no longer here, but uh, I would like to acknowledge the great work that ICMPD is doing through the migration, uh, the Mediterranean Transit Migration Project. Um, they have done this map which shows the main routes uh, around the Mediterranean and around Europe. And just looking at these routes, which are based on reports that they receive from various partners in this project, you can see the complexity of migration, the complexity of the routes, uh, but of course also the complexity of the reasons why people move. I'll come to that later. So the question then is who actually manages this migration, because we all pretend that we try to manage migration. In the end, I'm convinced after all these years that we can manage certain aspects of 
of migration, but that we cannot manage migration as a whole. But these are some of the actors that uh, are very much involved in managing migration. Then another development that came up during my time in IOM is actually international migration law, something that as a compact didn't exist some 10 or 20 years ago, and it was only uh, when people started to look at all the sources of uh, law, mostly soft law actually, very little uh, except the ILO conventions and the Convention on the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families uh, binding. Uh, we tried and are still trying to group them and uh, publish uh, a review of what exists in this field and uh, it is very interesting because migration is such a complex uh, topic in how many different areas you find legislation that somehow impacts on uh, migration. It can be trade law, it can be almost anything. Uh, our new book on this is coming out, uh, edited by Richard Perushu, our former uh, legal counsel, in a few months. I'm sure it will be bought by the library of the European University Institute. But it was around the beginning of this uh, millennium when um, governments started to look at uh, doing more than just saying, okay, we have all these norms, but how uh, do they actually impact on migration? And uh, how do we deal with the other group, not the refugees, who are well protected under international law by the Geneva Convention, the protocols, and so on? And the Swiss government, that is usually very active, now they are very uh, active at the moment of migration and development in the context of the global forum, but they brought together what's called the Burn Initiative, and if you're interested in looking at uh, all this background, I think the Burn Initiative is one of the most complex uh, uh, explanations of the various aspects of uh, international migration, international migration issues, its management, and so on. And there uh, you find this uh, expression of the need to be able to provide protection to and sustainable solutions for refugees and other in need of international protection. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of uh, what I call the mixed flows dilemma, where uh, we realized uh, that in one boat arriving in Lampedusa, you could have a refugee and asylum seeker uh, some in another country, uh, you could have a victim of trafficking, you could have an unaccompanied minor, all of them needing some sort of assistance, some sort of protection but not necessarily all receiving the same attention uh, by uh, the destination country. Uh, look at the case uh, in Italy. If you're an unaccompanied minor, you receive automatic protection. If you are a refugee, you receive it. If you are a victim of trafficking, it's already much more difficult, although the legislation is there. And that is when we then created together with UNHCR and Red Cross and Save the Children the Lampedusa model here in the country. Again, there's so little time, but uh, it might be worthwhile to look up what Lampedusa model means and what it has uh, come to. Now, in recent uh, months, I would say, we have started developing another concept, and we're really at the beginning of it and already receiving a lot of flack for it, although we ourselves are still thinking what this actually uh, means. We call this the migration crisis, and it's mostly uh, events where a crisis involves large numbers of uh, migrants, and that uh, could be anything from natural disasters to man-made uh, disasters. It doesn't mean that we want to create a new uh, uh, system for on the, at the international level how to deal with these, but sort of the concept, how do we deal with migration crisis? And here are some examples in the last uh, few years that clearly involved either displacement of populations or involvement of large numbers uh, of migrants uh, that needed international assistance that was somehow not guaranteed under the existing humanitarian system. And again, it's not just IOM. There are many partners that uh, are involved and uh, will be involved because this is uh, an eff effort for the whole international community. Now, a brief quiz. Uh, what was this about? Uh, when hundreds of thousands of migrant workers lost their jobs, their livelihoods, uh, 
were forced out of their host country, they arrived in neighboring countries, and they were migrant workers, not refugees, so they could return home. International community raised 120 million US dollars. We went in together with UNHCR, helped these people go home uh, to countries that had no jobs to offer, that lost the remittances that had been sent. So what I would say, the first major migration uh, crisis of recent decades. Uh, probably you think of Libya, but uh, a Jordanian friend will remember 22 years ago the invasion of Kuwait. So that was sort of the first uh, migration crisis in modern times where large numbers of migrant workers, and again, not refugees, could move to uh, their, own, their home countries. And then, of course, this was repeated uh, this uh, last year with the Libya crisis. And here you see uh, some of the flows of the migrant workers, uh, not the Libyans that we heard uh, about earlier, from uh, Libya to most of the neighboring countries, Tunisia and Egypt that played a fantastic role in accepting them. But uh, look at the numbers of people that went back to Niger, to Chad. Uh, imagine what it means that uh, all these uh, people go back to families who had been living on the remittances that uh, they had sent home, uh, the economic drama. And some of the crisis that we see now in the Sahel, in northern uh, Mali, and Philip spoke about that earlier, is also directly related with uh, events in Libya. Uh, at the same time, uh, you had this return, you also had problems in some of the African uh, countries in uh, West Africa. So uh, Libya itself was a major event. It triggered, uh, however, not just the return of migrants, but also crisis throughout the whole zone. Uh, so again, this is the migration crisis, what sort of crisis is, but definitely a lot of migrants were involved in this. Now let me look at some other countries around uh, the Mediterranean, uh, Morocco. Uh, Morocco, uh, we hear a lot about, Morocco is doing very much for its own citizens uh, abroad. They have a minister dealing with uh, uh, the resident uh, Marocain à l'étranger. Uh, but there are also increasing numbers of sub-Saharan Africans, Africans stuck in Morocco. They cannot go any further because now the controls, the cooperation between Spain, France, Morocco, uh, works pretty well. Uh, and there is no system for them in place and we haven't been able to find uh, donors uh, to help these people uh, amongst the, the usual suspects. So uh, we have every day in our office in Rabat uh, sub-Saharan Africans who want nothing else but to go home, to be helped, to get a ticket, to go home to their countries where they came from. There is no donor around because there is little interest in this. Also an aspect of uh, lack of cooperation on uh, migration management. They are victims of trafficking, they are, they are victims of gender violence. It's just some NGOs who deal with this. It's a major drama in the making that you don't hear much about. The Syria crisis, well you heard about it already so well in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, you have here the latest numbers uh, from Syrians in Jordan, in Turkey and in uh, Lebanon. But there's also a small, uh, and these are refugees, these are not IOM's uh, concern, they are uh, with our friends in UNHCR. But there are also not as many as in Libya, but uh, tens of thousands of migrant workers uh, caught in Syria. And they are slowly coming out uh, and they turn again uh, to us. So again, a little migration dimension of a much bigger crisis. But another drama in the Syria crisis is that all the, those refugees who were in the pipeline for resettlement, uh, Iraqi refugees, I find it now very difficult uh, because the consulates the, of the destination countries, the US, Canada, they have all closed. There's no interviewing. Um, the ones that are still in the country but are being processed, we, have, we still manage to get out somehow. But uh, our operations in Syria are slowly coming to a halt because of the crisis and uh, thousands of refugees will not be settled because of this. Another area, Somalia and the whole Horn of Africa. Uh, the boats that arrived only last uh, night again in Malta, Somalis. Um, the uh, situation there is improving uh, thanks to the intervention, but it is not 
far from perfect and these are some of the main reasons why there is still uh, displacement. Most of it again, not to Europe of course, but to Kenya, to neighboring Ethiopia and so on. And then many from the Horn of Africa also trying to move through the Gulf of Aden to uh, Yemen, to go on to Saudi Arabia, where also the border controls have increased. Egypt, Sinai in particular, and Israel. Uh, Egyptian authorities are stretched. They have about 18 detention centers that need refurbishment where people live in the worst conditions you can imagine. There's simply no means for this and in the country that has other problems at the moment, clearly this is uh, not a priority for them. And uh, you also notice increasing hostility, at least uh, in expressions, but also in some measures against the irregular migrants uh, in Israel, who are called infiltrators by some, and uh, uh, they are now just talk about forced returns to South Sudan and so on. And uh, sort of the winner, the Turkey-Greece border, it has become now the most important uh, transit country, or uh, transit route for uh, illegal migration to Europe. There's some quotes from Frontex. So what can we do in response to the migration dimension of crisis. Well, as I said before, coordinated uh, approaches uh, between the various humanitarian actors. Uh, and insist that the principal protection responsibility lies with the states, not with uh, international organizations. What can we do? We would need a funding mechanism for migration emergencies to help people like the ones uh, stranded currently in Morocco. Diaspora engagement is very important and the fact that during the crisis, as we heard before, the remittances to Egypt went up, that's a normal trend. Uh, when there's a crisis, uh, the people abroad send more money home uh, to their families uh, than in other situations. Also facilitating channels of labor migration and uh, resettlement. Resettlement, uh, again, a very close cooperation between HCR and IOM. Uh, HCR uh, does the selection or the pre-selection for the governments. And uh, then uh, we take over uh, the health assessments, uh, the logistics, the pre-departure orientation, the movement of uh, people so far. In the last decade, we have moved almost 900,000 refugees uh, to new destinations. Mostly not in Europe, I must say. Uh, we do this with partner agencies, with NGOs who play an increasingly important role in reception. Uh, this is a snapshot of IOM movements on 27th September 2011. Just one single day, uh, the flights that IOM organized for refugee resettlement. In fact, it's not known very well, but we are one of the largest logistics agencies, uh, international agencies, I think after WFP and probably UNHCR uh, in the world. Now, and then we look at uh, what happened uh, in Europe, what happens in Europe. Little Malta uh, got already before the current uh, Libya crisis, every year a, boat, a few boats of about 1,500 people. So the Maltese went and asked uh, other European partners would they take some in a relocation program. Well, this is the result. Uh, 150 uh, to Germany, the year before a few to France. So the European solidarity there was uh, about uh, 300 people, not a great uh, success, I would say, but at least it showed some solidarity. The Americans have taken hundreds and hundreds and are still are taking them out of Malta for resettlement. So they are helping more. And this is um, the total of our support to resettlement uh, to Europe in 2011, 9,436 people. And we transport practically everybody who gets resettled. So again, compared with the 80, 70, 60,000 that the US takes and the Canadians and the Australians, it's very, very little. Now, what other solutions could there be? Start throwing things at me. Uh, I'll be finished soon. Uh, 
economic migration programs for refugees and other victims of forced displacement. I know this is very dear to the heart of the High Commission of Refugees also. Not to separate these refugees, saying, okay, you are protected, but now you sit and do nothing, but uh, try to help them. Uh, facilitating regular and safe mobility and also assisted voluntary return. For the assisted voluntary return, we get often criticized because people say how voluntary is the whole thing. Uh, but it is a solution and hundreds of thousands of people have gone back to the Balkans, uh, to other parts of the world and uh, even last year more than 35,000 people were helped to return to various parts of the world, mostly from Europe. There are actually three types of returns as we classify them, the voluntary without compulsion, the voluntary under compulsion, and that is where we have these uh, debates with NGOs and, and others, because they say, well, if the alternative is either deportation or jail, how voluntary is this? Uh, we claim that there's still an advantage of turning, returning home with some dignity without a stamp in your passport deported and maybe even without a ban on re-entering under a legal scheme uh, into the, let's say the Schengen area later. And then of course the involuntary which is not in no way and no case done by IOM. Uh, the forced returns is something that uh, governments uh, have to do on their own. We cannot, based on our constitution, help them. Thank you very much. I hope that was not too long. And Thank you very much. Uh, I return that you started with uh, um, removing this hope of managing migration so we can manage only some aspects of migration and forget about managing completely migration. Uh, as you um, specified, we explain IOM is not supposed in its mandate to deal with refugees, but has taken more and more importance in protecting uh, migrants and uh, potential refugees. And because refugees move increasingly, as you said, with uh, and along other migration scheme, which has raised this uh, mixed flows dilemma, uh, as you called it. So uh, IOM has tried to develop some uh, new notions, some new, uh, some new response um, to face uh, this evolution in migration and created this new concept of migration crisis that would have started at the beginning of the 90s. And one kind of help uh, in case of migration crisis, of help to people in need of protection, would be to helping them returning home. And that's why we uh, observe more and more collaboration between IOM and UNHCR um, in the framework on, uh, of uh, refugee crisis worldwide. So we will see now um, the, the position of uh, Maybe, I don't know if it's the position of the organization, but at least uh, maybe another part uh, where refugee protection is really your mandate. Uh, so it's now your... Okay, okay, thanks. Can you just put it onto full screen? Slideshow. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I feel this is a very heavy responsibility as I'm the only person standing between you and the cocktail. Um, so I will, keep, I will keep going until the chairperson tells me to stop. Uh, hopefully I haven't prepared too much. Um, let me make three introductory, or a few introductory comments. The title of the presentation is Forced Migration and the International Community, Key Trends and Policy Issues. Um, three quick observations. Firstly, Peter and I met in Geneva last week to try and make sure we didn't overlap too much. I think given Peter's enormous amount of 
of experience in this region, the Mediterranean and Europe. Um, understandably, he focused on that. My, my perspective is going to be a little bit more global. Um, secondly, in the course of my presentation, I'm going to give you some statistics, but I should immediately say, and my former colleague, Bella Hovey, sitting in the front row, uh, would agree with me that some of these statistics are rather suspect, or at least unreliable. Uh, getting accurate data on false migration is not easy, and so some of the statistics I'll give you will be kind of nominal statistics, but may, may need to be looked into a little bit more closely. And then my third point is simply to say that as an agency, UNHCR is responsible for refugees around the world, with the important exception of the Palestinian refugees in the Middle East. And so my comments will be more broadly cast at refugees in general, and I won't make, be making any specific remarks about the Palestinian refugees. Just to give you a sense of what I'm going to say in the next uh, few minutes, um, and I'll just read the summary that I've prepared. While forced migration is a somewhat contested concept in academic circles, and it's contested because some people don't think it's possible to make a clear-cut distinction between people who move on a voluntary basis and people who move on an involuntary basis. While this concept is somewhat contested in academic circles, the international community has nevertheless developed a substantial network of laws, norms and institutions specifically designed to address the situation of refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced populations. And what I tried to do in the next few minutes in this presentation is to identify some of the key and, I should stress, interrelated trends and policy issues in relation to these groups of forcibly displaced people. I'll try to say something about the implication of these trends for operational agencies such as my own, UNHCR, and um, hopefully I'll come up with a few ideas which may be of interest, particularly to the summer school participants, uh, anybody who's interested in doing further research in this area. And the global trends and policy issues I'm going to try and focus on if I have enough time. Uh, there are eight of them in total. The prevalence of armed conflict, long-term refugee situations, the growth of internal displacement, the urbanization of forced migration, the mixed nature of migratory movements, something that Peter has already referred to, the impact of climate change and natural disasters, the link between solutions and mobility, and finally the whole issue of international cooperation and solidarity in relation to uh, forcibly displaced people. I hope I can quickly get through all of those eight themes in the next few minutes. Okay, let's start with the prevalence of armed conflict. There are a number of academics and academic institutions that have been trying to measure changing patterns of armed, uh, of armed conflict to see whether there is now more or less armed conflict than there was in the past, to see whether contemporary armed conflicts are more intense uh, and lead to more deaths than those in the past. Uh, I don't want to get into that debate as to whether conflict is growing or diminishing. I simply to say that as an operational agency, UNHCR considers itself to be working in an extremely volatile operational environment at the moment. And the volatility of the operational environment in which we work, I think, stems from two uh, main factors. Firstly, the fact that a number of long-term conflicts have been left unresolved, and here I'm thinking particularly of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, three conflicts which have generated enormous numbers of both refugees, internally displaced people, and asylum seekers. These conflicts have gone on for several years and don't seem to have any prospect of being resolved in the immediate future. But added to that, on top of that, what we've seen in the past 24 months, the past two years, is a, a, a very kind of rapid spate of new emergencies that have also displaced large numbers of people and where we've been called to respond. And I'm thinking since June 2010, the last 24 months, I'm thinking primarily of situations such as Kyrgyzstan, Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, South Sudan, and now, of course, both Northern Mali and Syria. So this is um, uh, adding to the volatility of the environment in which we work. And if you plot these conflicts on a map, you'll see that there's quite a clear-cut arc of crisis. It starts in Afghanistan and it moves westward until you end up in the Sahel and northern Mali. You'll see most of these conflicts are contiguous and in many cases they're actually connected to each other. They're transnational conflicts and in fact the movement of people from one country to another is, I would argue, one of the factors that helps to shift these conflicts across international borders from one country to another. Now, what has been the result of 
these trends that I've been mentioning. Well, firstly, and most obviously, a greater level of displacement. The total number of conflict-related displaced people around the world is now estimated by some people to be in the region of 42.5 million worldwide. And again, according to some people, in 2011 alone, there were an additional 4.3 million people displaced from their homes. Now, I think as Peter already mentioned, refugees were a minority in that number. We calculate the number of new refugees in 2011 to be 800,000 out of the 4.3 million that were displaced. Another consequence of these conflicts has been less repatriation. If you look at the figures for returning refugees going back to their country of origin, there's been a steady decline over the past 10 years. And we can attribute that, I think, both to the persistence of the older conflicts, but also the, uh, the, the eruption of new conflicts in many parts of the world. The other issue I'd like to draw your attention to in, in relation to the prevalence of armed conflict is the pressure that this has placed on the capacity of UNHCR and the humanitarian system in general. Uh, my unit has been doing a, a number of evaluations of recent UNHCR emergency operations, and to be very honest, the performance has not been that great. Uh, for example, the Somali influx into Ethiopia last year, extremely high levels of malnutrition and extremely high levels of mortality. And one of the conclusions I think we're drawing from this is that when you're obliged to deal with multiple emergencies in different parts of the world simultaneously, it's actually quite difficult for an agency to respond in as effective a manner as it would like to do so. So that's the prevalence of armed conflict. The second one is very closely linked to this, which is that increasingly around the world we see a number of large and unresolved refugee situations. And over the recent years in much of the academic and policy literature, this has given rise to a new concept, that of protracted refugee situations. And a few years ago, UNHCR came up with a definition of a protracted refugee situation. It's not a particularly good definition. It has a number of flaws, but it's the one that has kind of stuck and that most people are using. And we define a protracted refugee situation is one in which involves 25,000 or more refugees, people of the same nationality, people who have been living in their country of asylum for four, four, five years or more, and people who have no immediate prospect of a solution to their situation either by repatriation, by locally integrating in the country of asylum, or by resettling to a third country. And again, if you look at the figures, you'll see some quite uh, interesting uh, findings. There's been a definite uh, growth in the number of refugees who find themselves trapped in such situations. Our most recent figure relates to the 1st of January this year. Uh, where we calculate just over 7 million people are trapped in these situations. There's also been a significant growth in the number of protracted refugee situations around the world. We now calculate them using our definition to be 31 of these situations in 26 different countries. We've also done some calculation to try and find out what is the average time that people spend in exile. And it seems that over the past 10 years there's been a definite uh, prolongation in the time that people spend in exile. And it's now approaching perhaps 50 15 years for the average refugee. The Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, which houses mainly Somali refugees, is a very good example. There are 6,000 children in the Dadaab refugee camp whose parents themselves were born in Dadaab. And so we're really kind of entering a situation where we're having third generation refugees. And in many of these long term camps, conditions are deteriorating. In an emergency, donor states find it interesting and attractive to support refugee camps because they're visible, they're tangible they're in the media, the longer a camp uh, is in existence in general terms, the funding available for it goes down and therefore conditions deteriorate. Now, for refugees who are stuck in camps for years or decades on end, what do they do? I think until recently there was a kind of an assumption, including within UNHCR, that refugees basically sat around receiving assistance and waiting for something to happen so that they could move on with their lives. And I think we're starting to move away from that perspective. According to some research that we've been doing recently, we're finding that refugees are actually taking very active steps to try and find solutions for themselves through mobility, by moving from a camp to a town or by moving on to another country, by establishing transnational lifestyles where they live in more than one country simultaneously. They move backwards and forwards like the Afghans who move regularly between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And increasingly we see refugees trying to acquire citizenship in the country that's offered them asylum, either by informal means or by irregular means. And when I say irregular, I mean simply by purchasing a passport or purchasing a national identity document.
The growth of internal displacement. If you look at the figures again, there seems to be a very sharp rise in the numbers. Uh, the current figures that we're using are 26.4 million conflict-related re internally displaced people. And that is well above the number of refugees around the world. I think the number of refugees is more like 10.5 million. So in other words, more than double the number of IDPs and refugees. Now, why is this? Why have IDP numbers gone up? And why do they seem to be much larger now than refugee numbers? And this is an interesting research question, which I'd give to any student as a challenge. And a number of different explanations have been offered as to this situation. Is it simply because there are more armed conflicts and therefore more people are displaced? Is it, some people have suggested, because there are more internal conflicts and internal conflicts tend to produce internally displaced people? To me it's a somewhat spurious argument, but some people have made that argument. Is it because there's more, one minute, oh my god. Um, is it because there's simply more awareness and advocacy around the IDP issue and therefore um, there's more attention being given to IDPs and more efforts being made to measure the numbers of them? Um, is it, as some people have suggested, that many uh, refugee uh, countries of asylum have closed close their borders and therefore rather than becoming refugees, um, people have been trapped within their own country and have been obliged to become internally displaced persons. Um, in terms of the protection of IDPs, I think there have been in recent years some distinctive protection games. Uh, we usually point to the guiding principles on internal displacement, which are non-binding law, but which provide advice to governments as to how to treat and respect the rights of uh, internally displaced people. There's a growing amount of national legislation which refers to the rights of IDPs. And there is also recently in Africa a, a, a binding uh, convention, the Kampala Convention, which again sets out the rights of IDPs. So at the legislative level, at least, there would appear to be some important protection gains. At the same time, we have to ask ourselves, have states and have non-state armed actors really changed their behavior as a result of these legislative uh, advances? Because in the field, operationally, we see persistent problems in trying to uh, respond to the needs needs of IDPs, states asserting their sovereignty, states denying access um, to UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies, states and non-state armed actors manipulating the aid which is intended to support IDPs, and often in IDP situations very high levels of insecurity which affect both the internally displaced people themselves and the aid workers that are trying to assist them. Two final points of this uh, before I kind of try to draw to a close. Um, I think a number of us have started to have serious doubts about this whole question of IDPs. Is this actually, is the notion of IDP a sensible one to use? Something the International Committee of the Red Cross has said for many years is that simply movement shouldn't be taken as the key indicator of vulnerability. It should be the vulnerability itself that counts. And there may be many people who have not actually been obliged to move anywhere, yet nevertheless find themselves in very vulnerable circumstances. Circumstances. And you can imagine a Haitian family, for example, living in the rubble of their house, which has been um, destroyed by the earthquake. Technically, they're not IDPs because they haven't moved anywhere, but at the same time, they're clearly vulnerable people and in need of international support. And then a final issue related to IDPs is the whole question of coordination between agencies. There is no single agency responsible for internally displaced uh, people. And so attempts have been made over the past five years to try and establish a division of labor within the international humanitarian system so that it is known which agency assumes responsibility for which aspect of an IDP situation. That is still a problem and it hasn't quite yet been resolved. Um, I think all I can do in the next two minutes, uh, as I only had a minute and that was two minutes ago, is just to flag up yet again the key trends and policy issues that I was going to speak about. Okay, the fact that increasingly forced migrants are not found in camps, but are to be found in urban areas, and this has had an important implication for UNHCR. We're really reorienting our programs so that we meet the needs of people in urban areas, and in fact we try wherever possible now to avoid a situation where people are obliged to move into camps. I won't say anything more about mixed migratory movements as Peter already said something uh, about it. Um, climate change and natural disasters has become a very big issue in the humanitarian community. UNHCR has not been able to ignore that trend. We are quite closely involved in the discourse. Um, at this point, I will simply say that we have quite clearly rejected the notion of so-called climate change refugees. We think that the notion of refugee has a very clear un uh, definition in international law, and we believe that adding the notion of climate change to the word refugee would actually lead to considerable amount of confusion and may actually risk the rights
groups of uh, refugees as defined under the 1951 Refugee Convention. I was going to say a little bit about the way in which increasingly we find refugees um, using mobility in order to find solutions for themselves. As again, I said a few minutes ago, refugees don't sit around in camps waiting for opportunities to arise. They are very active <coughs> agents in their own life, looking for alternative solutions wherever possible. And then finally, one of the key themes that we're pushing at the moment, and I'll just say a little bit about this, the notion of cooperation and solidarity. If you look at the key principles that guide the work of UNHCR and which underpin the international refugee regime, if you look at the UN Charter, the, the 1951 Refugee Convention, the UNHCR statute, they all make very substantial reference to these two notions of international cooperation and international solidarity. And I think for quite a long time, these principles upheld were upheld quite well. In the 1950s, when the main focus of the refugee problem was in Europe. There was a lot of international cooperation in order to get people out of camps and to find new lives for them. And similarly, in 1956, with the Hungarian refugee crisis, a lot of international cooperation and solidarity to resolve that problem. As the refugee problem moved away from Europe and into the developing areas, there was a kind of a deal struck between the North and the South. And the, the deal was essentially that the countries in the South, the developing countries, would keep their borders open, they would allow refugees to come in, they would allow refugees to stay on their territory for as long as they needed to, as long as the North essentially paid all of the bills provided the funding to UNHCR to provide assistance to those refugees so that the cost to the developing countries was minimised. And until quite recently, that deal, I think, has held up quite well. What we see now and what is quite worrying is that the deal is very much under pressure. Clearly, the refugee burden is a very unequal one. Around 80% of the world's refugees are in developing countries. Only 20% are in the industrialised states. Increasingly, developing countries with refugee populations are reminding us about what they call the cost and impact of the refugees living on their territory. And we suspect that in the near future, they, might, they may start to use the language of compensation. You know, there is a cost to hosting refugees. These refugees do have a negative impact on our society, economy and environment. Therefore, we are going to demand compensation. Otherwise, we will no longer allow them to stay on our territory and we'll push them back to their country of origin. That's a very real risk at the moment. The industrialised states are very unlikely to go along with that suggestion. Their line is, look, we're already providing millions of dollars to UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies. We're already taking in hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers. We also have resettlement programs to bring refugees from the developing world to the industrialised world. We're in a recession. What more can we do? So with the recession, with the risk of less funding, we see some kind of a risk that developing countries in the south may potentially start to try and close their borders to new refugee influxes. Very last point, although that sounds a little bit pessimistic, I think one of the things we would like to end the presentation on is to stress the fact that uh, despite the negative trends that I've identified in many parts of the world, we do continue to see solidarity with refugees and asylum seekers and we feel that that solidarity should be celebrated. And I'll just give you three very quick examples. One, the the Libya crisis that has already been mentioned. Uh, in the initial stage of the crisis, at least, those who went to Tunisia were assisted not by UNHCR, not by international humanitarian agencies, but were assisted by Tunisian citizens who were trying to uh, give some help to people coming across the border from uh, from Libya. Last year I was in Liberia at the height of the influx from Cote d'Ivoire and again we saw villagers in Liberia opening their homes, providing food to refugees as they arrived, despite the fact that they had very little themselves. And then just uh, two days ago I was reading a newspaper article in a Zambian newspaper about a threat by the Zambian uh, authorities to forcibly return Angolan refugees to their countries of origin. And I was very interested to see under the comments column underneath the article Article, that dozens of Zambian citizens had written in to say, don't send these people back. They've been living in Zambia for 20 or 30 years. We consider them to be our brothers and sisters. They should be allowed to stay. And that's the kind of solidarity which I think gives us hope that the international refugee protection regime can survive another 60 years, as it has done already. And I've got one picture. Thank you.
Thank you very much. You had a difficult mission to present the range of new missions, situation and challenges that uh, your organization has now been facing for at least the last uh, 20 years. The evolution of the need of protection and um, all these new challenges that UNHCR tries to, uh, for, for which the organization tries to find some responses. And I think that everybody appreciates that after um, this long list of difficulties and uh, the pessimism um, that uh, could emerge from all this list, you try to end with this optimistic touch of solidarity, at least in some part of the world, for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, so unfortunately, Peter Schatzer had to leave because he had to run to uh, get his flights. But uh, I open now the floor to question uh, for Jeff Crisp. I thought, so, I thought we were yes. going straight to the cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I'm sure there are some questions. <laughs> so one question here. Hello, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I would like to ask about the resettlement uh, quotas and the role of UNHCR. I would like to give an example about Turkey. For instance, uh, uh, last uh, years in 2009 and 2010, um, for instance, uh, newcomers was around 6,000 and resettled refugees was around um, 5,000. Now uh, the quotas are the same, but the refugee flow is increasing. Like uh, il last year, 11,000 people applied for asylum and the quotas remain the same. So what is UNHCR's role uh, to increase uh, the quotas of, for resettlement and uh, for uh, f funding uh, the camps and other uh, opportunities for refugees and I, I don't know, you knock the doors of the governments and you ask for budgets. Uh, I would like to learn deeply about your role in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for, for this presentation. I have a question about an issue which I don't know whether you really touched on it directly or not and maybe Philippe and, and, and Delphine can also help with that. There is the individual determined as a refugee under the 1951 convention. And then there is the individual determined as a refugee under the 1969 OEU convention. So, the OEU convention, the OEU convention. So the OEU convention is much more liberal in determining who a refugee is. But countries of asylum would only give asylum to those recognized under the 1951 convention. So this leaves a good, a good number, a good volume of refugees in some African countries with no hope of being resettled. They are under the impression of being refugees like other refugees under the 1951 convention, and yet they do not qualify for resettlement by uh, uh, asylum countries. This creates, this creates a problem for countries of transit, for countries of, 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 of transitional, or, or I mean, the countries where, the, or the first countries of, uh, of asylum. What do you say about how can this how can this problem be solved? Do you have any, has, has any research been done on how to reconcile uh, uh, these, uh, these two, two, uh, two poles of, of the question? Thanks, I have five questions for Peter, but uh, as he's not here, I was going to ask whether every crisis needs a new uh, new words. Do we need the word migration crisis? Uh, 20 years ago we talked about refugee crisis, then we, we got humanitarian crisis, now we have migration crisis. Um, but uh, as Jeff is there, um, I want to use the word compensation and I think that's a very important uh, 
uh, yet a dangerous word in the international community. We try to avoid it. But in fact, the system that he was describing, and that's my question, about, and he already said it himself, massive assistance to first asylum countries, resettlement opportunities, uh, assistance to local communities, there is a, that's already a form of compensation, I would, I would argue, but just with a different word. So that is, in fact, the essence of what you were saying, in the burden sharing aspect. Now, migrants are not the same as refugees, but clearly there are also countries of origin that are uh, losing and some are, are gaining. And the idea of compensation is also sometimes being mentioned in the migration context. Uh, some people think that the country of origin should be assisted in terms of uh, uh, Compensating for the brain drain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think in all these uh, uh, movements of people, the, there are some similarities. And I don't know, uh, Jeff, whether you can say something about that issue of compensation. Quid pro quos are always always there. So how different is the current discussion as it was, uh, let's say, 50 years ago? And can you compare it maybe a bit with with migration as well? I have a comment on Turkey, but I will talk to you later. We can start maybe with these three questions. Yeah, sure. Because they are important. Okay. Um, on the issue of refugee resettlement, I mean, I think there are two important points to make to begin with. <clears throat> Firstly, the scale of refugee resettlement is extremely small, small by global standards. Uh, in a world where there are possibly 42 million people displaced uh, by conflict and persecution, in a world where there's more than 10 million refugees, we're actually only resettling around 70,000 a year. So this is a very kind of limited proportion of the world's refugees population. One of the figures we're also using, although I've never quite understood how it's uh, calculated, and maybe Bella can help me. We've recently, we've recently said that there are 800,000 refugees in the world in need of resettlement. Now, I don't understand why the figure is not larger, because if you're on a protracted refugee situation, and we have 7.1 million people in such situations, you could argue that they're all in need of resettlement because they have no other solution available to them. Anyway, the basic point to make, I think, is the scale of refugee resettlement is very small in terms of the overall numbers of refugees in this place people in the world. <clears throat> um, and then the second point, which is probably not always very clearly understood, and maybe UNHCR should bear some of the blame for this situation, is that ultimately UNHCR doesn't decide who gets resettled and where they go to. And I think as Peter already said in his presentation, UNHCR refers cases to resettlement countries. We do an initial screening to see who may be eligible for resettlement. But at the end of the day, um, it's the resettlement country that decides who who is given authorization to enter that state. That is certainly and absolutely not the perspective of most refugees. When you go to a refugee camp, when I go to a refugee camp, particularly if I'm wearing my UNHCR cap, I'll be immediately mobbed by hundreds of refugees asking, please, sir, can you get me resettled? And to try and explain to them, I'm sorry, it's not UNHCR, it's the resettlement country, that's a very difficult message uh, to, to put across. Um, in terms of what we're actually doing to expand um, the number of resettlement opportunities, I mean, and there are not that many options, to be very honest. And what we're doing is, firstly, the first objective is to uh, try and encourage existing resettlement countries to maintain their existing quotas. As some of you will know, the vast majority of resettled refugees go to the USA, followed by Australia, Canada, and uh, to a much smaller extent, New Zealand. And uh, at a time of economic downturn, uh, at a time when perhaps foreign nationals arriving in a country and being given certain degrees of support is not always welcomed by the national population, this is to some extent quite a hard sell, but we are trying to encourage those states that already have refugee quota systems uh, to maintain those quotas and, if possible, to even expand them. Uh, the second kind of strategy that we're using is to try and increase the number of countries that are um, actually accepting refugees refugees for resettlement. Um, the f I haven't got the precise figures with me. The number has gone up quite significantly uh, over the past decade, but generally speaking, uh, the new, what we call the new resettlement countries are taking extremely small numbers. So there have been some success. I think Brazil is one example. Iceland is another example. Uh, Bulgaria is another example where we're trying to encourage those countries or where we've already succeeded in, in, in persuading them to establish resettlement settlement quotas, but you're talking of 10 or 20 people, not, not thousands of people. Um, 
Perhaps for us, the kind of the biggest nut to crack, if I can use that expression, is Europe. Um, Europe generally resettles very, very small numbers of people, with the possible exception of Sweden, where the number is a bit higher. Um, one of the arguments that's often advanced by the European states is, well, we receive so many asylum seekers and we grant refugee status to so many uh, asylum seekers, you can't really expect us to also uh, resettle refugees through organised quotas. Um, as I think uh, you probably know, there has been a recent agreement uh, within the European Union to establish a European resettlement programme. It will, however, be an entirely voluntary programme, so member states will not be obliged to participate in it. And there will, as far as I understand, there will be no specific numbers. So if a country agrees to become a resettlement country, um, then it will determine exactly how many people it takes in. My final observation on resettlement was, although I think in principle it's a good idea to increase or expand the number of countries accepting refugees for resettlement, I think we should also be very careful about uh, which countries we're resettling people in. I think there has to be minimal standards, minimal levels of support um, for resettled refugees. And I was quite surprised recently, we did an evaluation of the UNHCR program in Bulgaria. We found that asylum seekers who arrive in Bulgaria and are given refugee status almost never stay in Bulgaria. They move on in the hope of arriving in Western Europe. And now that Bulgaria is, re is establishing its own refugee resettlement program, I think one could probably anticipate a similar situation. People will certainly accept resettlement to Bulgaria because it will get them out of refugee camps and it will get them into Europe. But once they're in Bulgaria, will the conditions for integration be so difficult that their first instinct will be to move on to another country where they consider the kind of support they get would be greater. So expansion is good, but it also has its risk and its dangers. Um, Ibrahim, I don't have an easy answer for your, for your question. It's certainly based on a very accurate um, perception and assertion that the 1951 Refugee Convention uh, specifies persecution on a number of grounds as the basic um, definition of a refugee. You have to be able to demonstrate a well-founded persecution on grounds of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a social group. The 1967 OAU Convention, the Organization of African Unity Convention, does extend the definition to include victims, I think, of external aggression and it, what it calls events seriously disturbing public order. As you said, Ibrahim, it's certainly true to say that in determining resettlement cases that many states, I think including the United States, it takes by far the majority, uses the 1951 uh, convention definition. So even though somebody's been recognized as a refugee within an African state, doesn't necessarily mean that they would have access to a resettlement program. Um, I think Peter's gone, and I shouldn't talk about him behind his back, but I will. Um, I, think, I think Peter knows that UNHCR has some concerns about this whole new notion of migration crisis. And another phrase that is being used, which we have even more concerns about, which is the migration consequences of humanitarian crises. And the reason that we are worried about this notion of the migration consequences of humanitarian crises is because it's a perfectly good word to describe people who are forced to migrate as a result of a humanitarian crisis, and that is the word refugee. And we see that the kind of support that some states are giving for this new notion of migration consequences or humanitarian crises could be a step in the direction of trying to kind of remove or, or, or question the special status of refugees and to question the rights and entitlements which they have under international refugee law. So in terms of re-describing, rephrasing such uh, situations, we would urge a degree of caution before uh, accepting these uh, expressions without further thought or analysis. Um, Bella, you're absolutely right. I mean, one could argue, although we don't use the word, we don't, one could argue that refugee hosting countries in the developing world do receive, if not compensation, at least considerable amounts of support. I mean, all of the expenditure of UNHCR, other humanitarian agencies, other UN agencies, um, and to some extent we actually support government structures themselves. I think probably where the, the word compensation comes in is that states in the developing world would like to see much more direct compensation to the state and not through humanitarian agencies. They'd like to get a bigger share 
share of the pie themselves. And that, I think, is going to be very difficult to persuade the donor states because, I mean, donor states have enough suspicions about UNHCR itself, but at least they're prepared to give us quite substantial amounts of money. I can't see a situation where uh, donor states are giving large amounts of support or compensation to states which have pretty poor record of, kind of financial and fiscal management. I don't see that happening. So it's going to be interesting to see how this tension between the donors and the hosts and UNHCR plays out. The other issue that you raise, which I think is a really important one, and I think I've always thought it's one that I've been surprised has not raised more, which is why do not countries that are hosting large numbers of refugees demand compensation from the country that generated those refugees? To the best of my knowledge, I've only come across one example, and I don't think it was pushed very strongly, which I think at one point Ecuador spoke to the government in Colombia and said, look, all of these Colombians are coming across the border. They're putting a lot of pressure on our services, our economy. We're having to spend money on them. Why don't you help us with it? And it's, it's, a, it's an entirely logical argument. Um, I suspect one of the reasons why that argument hasn't really taken root is because if you look at many refugee producing regions, I mean, a country that is, that is receiving refugee one day may be actually be generating a refugee the other day. And so if they make demands for compensation from a neighboring state, it may be a matter of months or years before the other country across the border makes demands upon them. So perhaps there's been a tacit agreement not to push this issue too far, but it is one that I've always been surprised has not had a higher profile. Okay. So I think we will stop here. The question, thank you very much. We see that uh, there was object of debate between uh, Peter Schatz and Jeff Griffiths, yes. of course. It's easy when he's not here. <laughs> he just, just escaped, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so we uh, couldn't go deeper. Um, so no, just, just a last word to thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to thank Jeff and P Peter uh, f for sharing the, their expertise on uh, a sensitive and complex issue of refugees. Uh, thank you to all of you, the speakers, the participants. I think that participation was very, very good. Uh, questions were just fantastic. We had two long but extremely exciting days, so thank you very much. And in particular, I would like to thank Pauline de Pierreux and Aurélie Boursier, uh, who organized everything. So thank you, and now we have the cocktail.